Good morning. My name is Jeff Sharp, and I'm director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed the Leaf Soku exercise to start us off. Matthew and Trevor, our facilitators today, have some engaging strategies for hosting online programs, and that was just the opening. In my seven years as director of the school, I've appreciated the importance of environmental education to the alums and community members who support our school. Environmental educators connect us to the outdoors through science, curriculum, problem solving, and frankly, fun. It is exciting to be joined in this program with educators from across Ohio who I hope, who I hope like us, are seeking to continuously learn, evolve, and adapt, just like our natural systems do. As we prepare for our autumn school year with significant time spent physically distance, it is critical that we consider innovative ways to keep people connected to our natural environments, including for learners of all ages experiencing days or weeks either at home or someplace outside of the traditional classroom. I think more than ever, it's important for us to be thinking about how we can be creative in delivering programming and educational experiences. I really want to thank all of you and your creativity up to this point, even pre-COVID. As director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources, I get to sort of see so many wonderful students coming to Ohio State interested in pursuing a career in environmental sciences, environmental studies. And um, I think it's a great credit to many of our environmental educators out there who inspired them. Just in the last five years, we've seen a doubling in the number of new first years joining us. And this fall at Ohio State, we are anticipating welcoming over 120 new first year students who are gonna be seeking to pursue a major in one of our environmental programs. Uh, really, it's your great work that sort of like helps does this. And I was even reflecting recently that we've actually seen a doubling in the number of freshmen coming to Ohio State initially thinking about environmental sciences in the last seven years, which is about how long the Environmental Professionals Network has been around. So cause and effect there, I'm not sure, but it's great to sort of like have both the EPN and you environmental educators here with us today. Before we start today's program, I want to thank Chris McGovern, an environmental remediation contractor for their sponsorship today. Environmental remediation contractor is a force for nature. ERC was created to serve the environmental and civil contracting industry centered around solar and water quality. Their team has decades of experience offering the best in project estimating, field execution, and project management to allow for on-time and on-budget safe results. To learn more about the ERC's work, visit ERCcontractor.com. Let us now move into today's program. I'm very excited about this topic area, and we are fortunate that Nicole Jackson, EPM Program Coordinator and Environmental Education Specialist and alum of our school reached out and connected us with Trevor and Matthew to develop today's program. She will provide additional introductory remarks. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, uh, for, for joining in on this awesome program that we're about to start. Um, I just wanted to um, just check in with everyone, but also I, I this was something that is very important to me. Um, I've been doing environmental education for some time. And um, I found out about uh, Matthew and Trevor's work um, beginning of the year, uh, right after the COVID-19 situation happened and um, just hearing all of the awesome uh, responses to their work and what they've been doing here in Ohio um, and connecting people to resources and opportunities to engage um, and connect uh, the, the instruction and facilitation of environmental education and outdoor um, experiential learning to what we're uh, transitioning uh, into because of uh, COVID. So I reached out just by email because um, I was really excited. Last year, uh, July um, of this time, we actually had a field trip uh, and that was an awesome experience just to be able to work uh, with different groups, different networks around environmental education and experiential learning. Um, and I did not foresee this at all, 100%, but the graphic that we created was a picture of um, a, a classroom of students uh, looking at a screen, um, and who would have thought that that kind of uh, foreshadowed what we would be, unfortunately, um, dealing with today. So I, I think you know, although these things are very stressful and there's a lot of uncertainty still happening in terms of how we're moving forward with um, education, uh, there's still very much opportunity uh, to find ways to connect with educators, professionals, um, anyone who's really interested in, in trying to figure out a new innovative and different way uh, to connect all these dots so we can continue educating 
um, each other and, and learning from one another. So I appreciate Matthew and Trevor uh, for reaching back out to me um, to put this together in, in such short notice. And um, again, they've been doing amazing work. I love environmental education because of the networking that I get to do and all of the wonderful educators that I've gotten to meet over the years and to see that enthusiasm and inspiration and, and hard work and dedication uh, to get people involved in all these different ways, um, again, has been very inspiring for me. So I hope all of you um, have the chance to experience that today uh, for this program. And uh, without further ado, Matthew and Trevor. Greetings, everybody. So glad that you're uh, with us today. As uh, Nicole said, this has been an absolute joy to uh, get to connect with uh, OSU EPN, as well as their team. And, and <clears throat> now with all of you uh, looking at the list today, it's pretty, pretty amazing the, the breadth of where people are coming from. And, and there's some people that we know in there. So glad to see you in a, in a screen. Uh, real quickly, a, a quick introduction about myself. My name is Trevor Dunlap, and I'm, I am the executive director of an organization up in um, well, he can stay poorest area called Nahop, and Nahop is a multifaceted organization that does a lot of work with with kids and adults and all sorts of uh, other humans. But the major factor of what uh, we're we're known for, and particularly in during COVID, is our um, our work doing environmental education and outdoor education. On top of that work, we also do a lot of uh, uh, type of programmatic stuff for kids with special needs and um, to us they're just kids. So what we're really excited about today is getting to share some of the best practices that we've, we've learned over the past four months and um, hopefully connect with you and see if there's some more strategies that we can collectively do together to, to help out humanity during this time. Matthew. Well, hello, uh, my name is Matthew and I see from all of your wonderful name placards who all of you are, I'm so excited to be a part of this, uh, this program today. What a fantastic organization. Um, and we're, we're just excited to share some of the things that we've learned uh, throughout this entire process. Uh, when I'm not uh, doing things with Trevor at Nahop, my day job is the chair of the education department at the College of Worcester here in Worcester, Ohio, just a little bit south of Cleveland for those of you who might not know where that is. Um, and it's fantastic. So I work with students who uh, primarily want to be seventh through 12th grade teachers. Um, and then I also do some of the foundations coursework. Uh, so a lot of that work that I do on a daily basis um, was a, just a perfect tie in for working with Trevor and his organization to kind of work through this particular transition. So uh, very exciting. So, so happy to be here and talk with everybody. So uh, we're going to jump into it. But first, uh, Trevor, I'm going to go ahead and share that Leaf Doku again. Uh, and for those of you that were here uh, when this was up, very, very simple activity uh, in terms of, for those of you, I guess simple is all relative depending on how <laughs> your brain thinks, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so for some of you, this might have been easy. For others of you, your head might have absolutely exploded, uh, which is okay. Uh, so we're going to put this back up here. Uh, we're interested to see it. So first things first, uh, there were four uh, different kinds of leaves there uh, in the chat. Do you want to go ahead, if you have it, go ahead and throw in what the four different kinds of leaves were. Let's see how you did there. If we, if we were able to at least get that far, I, I have complete faith, complete faith in this group. Now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> okay. I'll give you a hint. Oh, look at that. We've got, yes, we've got some good answers coming. Abby, very nice. Yes. Adam, thank you. Very good. All right. So we have people that are tracking in the right direction here. Uh, so as with regular Sudoku, um, you have to have all four of those leaves represented in a row you have to have all four of those leaves represented also in a column. And you need to have all four of those leaves represented in the color block. Uh, so it's, it's somewhat complicated and confusing, but we promise it's also uh, pretty, pretty uh, possible. Trevor, I think I want to point out, because Trevor was pretty excited when he made this. Uh, so 
he wanted, we originally had it just being letters, A, B, C, D, but Trevor went the extra mile and made sure that it still was A, B, C, D, but it was using the names of different trees. So I want to make sure that Trevor's, you know, extra creativity was pointed out there because that's, that was, he was going the extra mile there. Um, so rather than get the whole solution, um, one of the things that we encourage you to do at this point, this is just a fun, simple activity. If you have the ability and you want to go ahead and take a screenshot, uh, you can go ahead and, and do that. The screenshot's a, a great way for, for you to kind of keep and hold on to this particular uh, idea when we leave. Uh, but I will also, as soon as we go, I'm going to drop the, the PDF of this into the sidebar, uh, into the chat, so that you can uh, also have that as well. So, But with that, I'm going to turn things over to Trevor, and we're going to get things started. Quickly, one of the things that we wanted to model right from the start is uh, when we are in this digital space, the, the pedagogy behind how we do our work is still relevant. And so what we found and what we found in, in all of our programs is that when we start with something, kind of a hook, uh, a way to, to get things moving, gives the opportunity for people to engage so we're not just sitting in a screen looking at each other going like this. To model that can continuously, we want to think about the, the best practices in worst case scenarios. So when, when all of this, this COVID thing started to happen, we were sitting here going, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? One of the things that, that's the foundation of the work that Matt and I are going to talk about today is the fact that that good pedagogy can still continue even in a digital classroom. So we think about this space as our, our new forum, our new classroom to do the work that we get to do. So if we use that as the baseline for today, as we have our dialogue, you're going to see how we can have many different iterations of how we do our work. So just to start right off, like good practitioners would do, we would engage people instead of having talking heads talk at you the whole time. So our presentation today, our, our exercises today are going to be very interactive. There's going to be some talking, there's going to be some action. So to get into that action, what we're going to do is we're going to start today with an exercise that we call the endless list. What in this exercise that's going to happen is that we are going to give you a goal of creating the most entries based off of a category. So when we get into this session, when we get into the exercise and start moving forward with, with our new friends that we're going to meet in the screen, you're going to have two jobs when we break you into rooms. The jobs that you're going to have in these breakout rooms, number one, is somebody that we call a scribe or a recorder. So somebody that's really good at taking notes. I know that Susan James is in this uh, webinar with us today. She's really good at that job. Another thing is somebody that's a messenger. So if you've been in Zoom meetings, you know that when we break you into breakout rooms, you're going to see a little green screen up on the top up there. So when the green screen comes in, there's going to be messages that Nicole, the, the Pied Piper, she's going to be sending you some, some messages. And you want to look for those things because we're going to try to tell you uh, what's happening during the exercise and when you need to come back and other things to, to consider. When you make the move, what's going to happen is we're going to send you out into rooms of about five to six people. You're not going to see us, but you will be able to get those messages in the green line up above. Look to see what number room you are in. That's going to be really, really relevant. All right. Are you one, two, three, four, five? What's going to be important is to know whether or not you're an odd or even. Again, we're going to be in small teams. When you get into those rooms, when we break you out into those breakout rooms, what we want you to do is we want you to turn on a video and a microphone. Now, you want to introduce yourself, who you are, and what you do. So when you get into that space, who are you and what do you do? You're going to assign those jobs and roles, and you're going to jump into the task. So what are those tasks? In the odd number breakout rooms, you are going to be the greens. In the even number breakout rooms, you're going to be the rounds. So for the odd number people, what I want you to do when we get into that room, I want you to come up with things that are green in nature. So things in nature that are green. In the last minute, you're going to select your most unique entry. For the people that are the evens, we're going to do the same thing. You're going to think about things in nature that are round, coming up with as many identifiers as many things as possible in that time. And in the last minute, you're going to select your most uh, unique entry. Anything I missed, Matthew? No, we're excited for it. So this first stage, you're going to be coming back and working with these people again uh, during this webinar. So we are looking at this very much as just kind of an introductory getting to know you activity. Um, so the, the introduction piece that Trevor shared at the beginning is really important. We want you to know who 
who you're in a room with, um, but then jump in. Let your creative juices start pumping and let's see how many greens and rounds we can get. I put just as a reminder in the chat, if you are an odd number breakout room, uh, you are going to be doing greens. If you are an even numbered breakout room, you are going to be working with round objects or circles. All right, with that said, Nicole, if you don't mind, would you uh, send people off into their breakout rooms? All right, I will get that started. And you said about four to five people, correct? Yes, that'd be awesome. Okay. Everyone is flooding back in. This is fantastic. It's always my favorite part when they pop back into the screen so we can actually see who we are talking to today. You all look thoroughly <laughs> creative. Like you just, you had a mind meld of epic proportions. There, Deborah, you want to get them typing? <laughs> Yes. So my friends, when you come back in, what we would like to know is your, how you did. So what is your total number of entries? If you could put that into the chat bar, your total number of entries for your different categories. On top of that in the chat bar, if you don't mind, put the most unique entry that you came up with. So as you're coming back into this room, the uh, recorder can list for us in the chat bar the total number of entries you had per category. And then on top of that, the most unique entry that you came up with. And if you just put next to your uh, total number, just put if you were round or green, that would help us. And then can everybody just make sure they're on mute, um, aside from Trevor and Matthew, just so we don't have any. 22 greens. I see duckweed. Duckweed. Love it. Kiwi. 20 round, very nice. 43 entries. 43. Moss on a sloth, love it. <laughs> that's that is well done. That is, it's going compound. I think this is, <laughs> that's fantastic. That is well done, I love it. Chlorophyll. 45. Most, most unique chlorophyll. Sandy, I think your group is gonna like what you're doing today. This will be very, very good, I promise. This should work out really well. I love it. Praying mantis. Oh, that's Very good. Fun. I like that a lot. Sweet gum fruits. Fantastic. Total a cross section of a snake. <laughs> it's, it's who it's kind who of are like you people? Treat, I don't even like know. Like a tree cookie, but weirder. <laughs> I like that. I think that's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Nine green and parrots. I love it. That is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> We had lots of cross sections. We sliced everything up. Absolutely fun. Absolutely great. That is cool. So I, I'm so excited about this. So um, one of the things that Trevor wanted to talk about at the very beginning, we were looking at what this meant for us in terms of this whole change to this digital world. The idea of staying true uh, to our what we know to be correct and, and making sure that we are utilizing um, quality pedagogy. And so this particular experience, being able to take a group of however many we are, I haven't even looked, over 70 people, and reduce that down to smaller working groups so that you can have that kind of personal interaction that, that is the hallmark for so many of our instructional environments. That's so important. So throughout this whole experience, we're going to be making sure that we're doing that, coming back to the best pedagogy. It's not just going to be about talking and staring at PowerPoint slides. It should be about human interaction uh, an action-based pedagogy out doing the work that you're hoping students are, are going to do and others that you're working with. So that's fantastic. So why are Trevor and I here today? Well, uh, what happened was this whole idea of in the space of a few days, uh, the whole concept of a traditional educational experience was completely upended and for forced educators of all kinds to redefine the ways that we planned the way that we delivered and engaged students all across the globe. Think about how amazing that is as a phenomenon, as educators. Like this, this was truly universal. We all had to make this shift. Whether you were a classroom teacher uh, working in a nature center, whether you did community health, it does, we all had to figure out how to change what it was we were, we were tasked with doing. 
for those of us that relied on that experiential and immersive environmental uh, components for our teaching and learning, this presented again an unprecedented challenge. Um, one of the things that I was fascinated, you know, that the initial idea of you know nature will not be closed, um, but eventually what happened? Nature closed. Like we had to start shutting down parks, and we had to do all these things that you know we thought we initially environmentally were like, okay, we can stake our claim on this. You know, we're going to go with this. This is our, our our. We can hold on to this, and then even that started to change for us. And so nothing was secure we had to be really quick and creative in how we were making this, this change. So for us, the question became, how do we hold true to the belief and ethic of environmentally motivated and immersive teaching in a time where truly overnight screens became the universal mediator for learning. And for those of us in the environmental world, that is a terrifying concept. This is some, all this Huxley stuff. We're like, what is going on? That is my new reality. That is not it. I hug trees. We, that's what helps us. That's what, that's what feeds my soul. Um, so we had to make that change. We had to do that quickly. The one thing that Trevor and I are hoping to provide is just that, is hope. Um, the, the transition that we had to make as uh, an organization uh, worked. So traditionally, the, the Nahapa organization serves about uh, 4,000 some students uh, throughout their entire year of environmental programming. Uh, at their site. And in the span from March until June, the Nahap organization served over 18,000 people through their at home uh, outdoor education programming. Um, in addition to that, you know, most of Nahap's uh, participation is regionally based. And what Nahap found was uh, they were serving people from over 50 countries uh, doing this work. Uh, so it's when we, and, and not just coming and visiting. So in addition to that, the lessons that they provided, and I had put a link earlier um, in the, the webinar to the actual outdoor ed uh, site that you can go and take a look at. Um, you know, they were having in excess of 60 and 70,000 lessons being completed. Um, so the, the reach was huge, far beyond what Nahop had done in the past. Uh, and it was reaching an entirely new programmatic group that Nahop hadn't been able to access before. So it started to open up even new channels um, for, for what um, Nahop was hoping to do as kind of the internal belief and ethic of their organization. So we're here, we're excited to share what we learned. Uh, that's really important, but we're also here uh, to have fun. Uh, we want you to experience some of the things that we have uh, been doing with people all across the globe uh, and modeling some of those best practices in this really, really strange time. So we're going to use breakout rooms again. Uh, and this time, so your first session in your breakout room, uh, you were focusing more on kind of the getting to know you aspect. Hello, how are you? This is where I'm from. Let's try and come up with something a bit uh, crazy in terms of numbers of things that are green and round. This time, what we want you to do is we want you to start thinking more about the activities that you are going to be participating in during the webinar. So. Uh, what's going to happen? We've got two particular activities that are going to happen. And if you were in um, the odd group, you're going to be doing the activity focused on green. And if you're in the even group, you're going to be the activity focused on circles. So let's talk about those two activities first. You have, uh, there was a, you had a link that was sent to you that had uh, the handout for today that has both of the activities on it, uh, kind of in a, in a front back um, two page uh, readout. So let's talk about the first one that it's not easy being green. So this is Sandy coming back to your chlorophyll. I don't know where you went. Your camera was on, but now I lost you. Um, coming back to that whole thing about chlorophyll. Um, this and this for us, it, this is a time tested activity um, that has its origins all the way back in the 1970s. This came from uh, Steve Van Meter's uh, acclimatization work. Uh, and it's an interesting thing because this is really kind of, Trevor and I have a lot of points of connection uh, just back through our histories. And uh, Trevor's uh, father started the Nahop organization uh, based uh, predominantly on a lot of Steve Van Meter's acclimatization work. And this, uh, it's not easy being green, this uh, shades of green activity is truly one of my first memories as a kid in this environmental world. This was something that my father, uh, Dr. Herb Broda, um, his, his life's passion is getting people to, to go outside and, and use the outdoors as an instructional tool with young people. Uh, and I just remember uh, my job toting the boxes back and forth from the back of our minivan as he would teach 
uh, all of these teachers at the Wilderness Center, um, all of these awesome activities where you were on your knees and scrunching things and doing smush art and all. It was the time of my life as a young person. And so uh, this being able to come back and utilize this same kind of activity in a digital world uh, was awesome. And I, I distinctly remember sharing this with him when we first came out with this digital version of it and, and him seeing that transition come to life and just the, the excitement that he had for that. Um, and so the second activity uh, that we're going to take part in is also this uh, a, a fantastic, and you have the organizers, the, we call it circles are pointless. Uh, and if you go to the, the hop site where the actual activity is, and there's a quiz at the very end, because we, we wanted to make sure there was some sort of assessment measure that was incorporated into the content that was there. Um, yes, my dad is Herb. Herb is the bomb. I thank you uh, in, in chat. I could not agree more. Uh, so that's to be son of bomb is fantastic. So excited about that. Um, but on this, the activity, the circles activity you're going to be doing, uh, I don't know if many of you know, uh, Laura Grimm uh, is a, an environmental ed educator out in the, uh, in, in Ohio as well. She's through Downton Local Schools. And this is actually her, um, uh, her matrix that she uses with her students. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I do remember doing this with my dad. My dad had these as well on these index cards that you would just, as a kid, walking around outside, he'd give you an index card. We'd run off into the woods, find something. And it was, it was spectacular. So we're going to do some things that are similar to that today. Um, and, but first, one of the things that we want to do is modeling the pedagogy. So you have your instructions, what you're going to be doing. But the first thing we want you to deal with as a group is content, because that's important. We want you to give you some sort of background. Um, but Trevor and I are not interested in being the ones to sit here and teach you about the content. You are all environmental educators. So we want you to take on that task yourself. So what's going to happen is uh, very soon, Nicole is going to put you back into the breakout rooms that you'd used before. So these are people that you still know. Uh, and you're still focusing on the same topic. So if you did the green list, you're going to focus on the green content. If you are the um, circles group, you're going to focus on the circles content. So with that, here is the, the order of the, what I would like you to do. So when you get into your group, take a minute and read first the content. And you can choose to do that however you like. If you like to read silently, perfectly fine. Uh, if you want someone to read that out loud, because I know sometimes for me, I hear something I hear things in a different way when someone reads it to me. That's perfectly fine as well. You decide. You're educators. Think about all the different modalities that are at play. Decide how you want to accomplish that. Go for it. Second thing that I want you to do is once you've read it, I want you to take a minute and reteach it. Notice I said reteach. That does not mean reread the content. I really want you to dig in and say, okay, so if that's what this content is, how would you reteach that to each other? So spend just a couple minutes going back through the content saying things in your own words, adding, adding aspects of who you are and what you know back into that content. That's this whole idea. We want people and young people to connect to their schema and see how this knowledge connects to what the things that they already understand and know. Um, fantastic. So you've read, you're going to reteach. The third thing I want you to do is I want you to develop some sort of mnemonic device that helps us to remember your content. So this could be uh, perhaps an acronym right? That gives us kind of the initials for something that maybe relates to a larger word that teaches us all about the world of things that are green. So that's going to take a little bit of creativity and problem solving on your end. Um, but think about how these different activities are kind of scaffolded for how people think and organize uh, ideas. So this is very intentional. Uh, last but not least, we want to make sure that we are tapping also into the creative side of all this. So the last thing that your team is going to be asked to do is write a haiku that captures the essence of your content. Okay. So there's four things. And Nicole, when we get into a breakout room, she's going to, she's going to send a message to your breakout room, those four reminders. So you remember, you're going to read, reteach, develop a mnemonic device, and then write a haiku. Because this is such an advanced group, you are going to have 15 minutes to do this. We know you can. It's going to focus, force you to be task oriented. Uh, but I know, I know it's possible. So, Trevor, did I miss anything before we have Nicole push them back out? You nailed it. Fantastic. Okay. Let's do it. Awesome. So, we're going to uh, send you the reminders, the four reminders of what you should be doing right away once you get into your breakout rooms. And then uh, Nicole will also keep you task focused 
by giving you some uh, minute to minute reminders in terms of how quickly you're going to be coming back. Nicole, look at this, look at your chat. Look at how fast Nicole is on this. Right there in the chat, you have those things. Uh, that is fantastic, awesome, okay. So without further ado, Nicole is going to push you back out into your breakout rooms. We are so excited to see you when you come back and hear all of your amazing haikus. We wish you good luck. As soon, don't forget when you get to your breakout room, turn your camera on, turn your microphone on so that people can see and hear your amazing ideas. World's largest Brady Bunch here. This is fantastic. <laughs> As you are coming in, if you could please in the chat bar, uh, post your mnemonic device that you created as a team focused on your content. That would be amazing. And then also what we would love if you have someone who could post your haiku, that would be spectacular. We would appreciate that. But yeah, as put your, your number, your group number or team number. Oh yes, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That's perfect. Um, what would be spectacular is if there's someone from your group that is uh, willing or interested in reading your haiku, if you wouldn't mind using your uh, reactions uh, and give us a thumbs up so that Nicole can see that you are, are willing to share your art with the world of EPN, that would be amazing. Awesome, looks like we have Amy is thumbed up. We're good to go. We have any other thumbs up, that would be awesome. The haikus that are coming through are fantastic. Okay, we had Kent. Awesome, Amy and Kent. What are we doing thumbs up for? Uh, mm -hmm. Whether you'd be willing to share out loud your haiku. Okay, we got Kevin. Kevin All Harrison. Right. Nicole, I'm going to have you pick two of our thumbs uppers <laughs> who uh, share the um, their haikus here. And when okay, Nicole we'll calls on you, if you would just be able to unmute yourself so that we can hear the amazingness that is your team's haiku. All right, we'll start with Amy, Amy R. Okay, my haiku was math and nature, cool. Fibonacci is all here, go out and explore. I love it, awesome. I love it. That is spectacular. <laughs> Co coffee shop snaps, this is good stuff. <laughs> well done, well done. All right, I'll go with um, Kent Holleran. Oh, in there. Okay, yes, I'm, I'm here. I just, I apologize if you hear the <laughs> jackhammer in the background. <laughs> hey, that's um, all right. It's ambiance. Oh, sure it is. I, I deal with it every damn day now. <laughs> all right. Our haiku was nature in the round. Patterns and orders abound. One need only look. Ooh, I, love I that. like that. That was nice. That was like, nice. Nicole, we got to do one more. Did you get one, one more? more? I'm going to go with Gia. So Gia. Good. Gia was another person. Hi, Gia. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> there we go. There you um, go. Awesome. These have stories. Light bounces back, not absorbed. Chlorophyll is great. <laughs> Love it. Chlorophyll is great. Chlorophyll is great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gia. Thank you. So much t-shirt marketing material here. This is fantastic. Simple, <laughs> understated, but oh so true. I love it. That is fantastic. You all did a wonderful job. Just if you haven't done so, take a second to scroll through the chat uh, and see the mm -hmm. devices that people have shared as well as their haikus. They are splendid, splendid. Uh, I'm sure we can all find some good use for this, especially in some of our upcoming programming uh, as some good hooks uh, and anticipatory set right there. So that is spectacular. Very, very cool. All right. So we are going to, uh, I'm going to throw it over to Trevor and he's going to get our first outdoor adventure group on their way and doing some things. Uh, and then we're going to deal with the other group that's not doing things uh, here on Zoom. So Trevor, what do we got? 
So now that you've spent a little bit of time uh, getting to know the content and it's ready, you've got it dialed in, you've got that mnemonic, you've spent time with your, your peers in that breakout room, uh, we're gonna go outside. We're gonna do what EE people do. We're gonna actually engage in the natural world. Albeit, some natural worlds might be a patio, some might be a front lawn on, on a stoop. It might be your backyard, or if you're lucky enough to live in the country, your, your nature is a little bit different. But we're going to take advantage of what we have as a resource around us outside of our homes. We are going to start with the green team first. When the green team is working outside, we will take some time to talk through our process of development with the uh, shapes people. The shapes people are going to stay here. The green people, you're going to go outside and play. So here are the instructions for the green team. Use your handout, your phone, your iPad, or what other portable device that you might have. You're going to pull up the shades of green gradient that you played with, those that are the green right here. Ours is black and white, your grayscale, so hopefully yours is color. But you're going to use that. And what? since you're gifted environmental educators, we have assigned you the most advanced grid. This is what you get when you come to one of our sessions. You deserve it, all right? When we release you, you're gonna have 10 minutes to find as many matches of, uh, to the gradient as possible. You're gonna use that gradient, you're gonna go outside, you're gonna try to find as many matches as possible. Now, for the LNT in us, the leave no trace policy, we are going to just pick little pieces off. We're not gonna pick off the whole plant. So if you wanna pick those things, uh, pieces off those plants, you can take them. You don't need the whole leaf or the plant to match it to the gradient. When you are gone, we'll be chatting with the shapes folks. Don't worry, you won't miss anything. We'll have the same chat when the shapes people are outside playing and it's their time for their hunt. Everybody understand? Anything I missed, Matthew? No, when you come back, uh, this is a great time. If you wanna take a picture of your surroundings where you're collecting all of your shades of green, uh, when you come back in your chat function, you have the ability to upload a file. So if you want to upload uh, one of those pictures, feel free to do it. Or if you want to upload the collection of green that you have found arrayed in your gradient, that would be awesome as well. So it's completely up to you. Uh, if you look in your chat, you'll notice at the bottom where you type everything in, there's a button that says file, and that will allow you to click. And then you can uh, upload uh, an image that you have taken um, to, to share. Not required, obviously, but if you'd like to share that kind of surroundings and information that you've been using to gather all this stuff, go for it. We'd love to see it. So with that said, this is experiential. We want you to go outside and play. So Greens, this is your time to move away from the screen, get outside, get some kinesthetic learning, move like Matthew. If you do, you're going to be sweaty, but you're going to go on outside and you're going to get to go play. And then the shapes people stay with us. We're gonna talk a little bit, unpack some of the, the, the information that we wanna share with you. Greens, when you come back in, join the screen if you catch us at that tail end, and then we're gonna, we're gonna move on in the process. So Greens, you don't, you don't have to turn your computer off. You don't have to leave the meeting or anything. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the home fires burning for you. Uh, you'll just be able to, when you come back, jump back on, uh, we'll be good to go. So we'll see you soon. Just make sure your screens, if you're leaving to go outside, that you're muted while you're gone. So don't yeah. have any of the weird background sounds. <laughs> so, so 10, ten minutes, minutes, 10 minutes, 11, 17, 11, 17 is when you are coming back. So Good with those question. folks that are remaining, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how this thing came to be and how we, we engaged. And so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the who, what, and why of the, the at-home project that we created. So luckily enough for Nahop, we had the privilege of uh, working with Dr. Matthew Broda, who's in the screen with me. Uh, he happened to be on sabbatical. And over time, Nahop and, and the College of Worcester have had a, a great collaboration as we think about uh, uh, teaching and learning and, and educational pedagogy. So we, we were, we were lucky enough to have Matthew kind of embedded in our team when all of this, uh, this COVID thing happened. Uh, the WHO also was an amazing staff. One of the things that we, we strive for at NAHOP, like most of our centers, is trying to find the right people to conduct the type of program that we want to do to engage learners in the out of doors. 
for me, I have two types of staff. I have the full-time team, which are the ones that, that keep the things rolling and getting the right people into place. And then I have my, my team of seasonal, uh, I call them global vagabonds, the ones that are really passionate about trying to solve all the problems of the world and, and serve kids in different ways. So they come to me from all over the United States, uh, sometimes other countries to come work with uh, the students that we have the privilege of working with. And on top of that, we had a, uh, another colleague of ours, uh, one of my full-time team members was actually a videographer by degree, although he had some experiential learning background. So he's my programs manager. So that is the who, the people that conducted uh, or created this project. Matthew's gonna talk a little bit about the what. Make sure I'm unmuted. Oh, yeah, good, I'm unmuted. So this idea uh, came at us immediately, and I'm sure you all had that same experience as soon as the, the announcement came down, especially related to schools. As soon as that happened, where we saw that schools were going on their extended spring break, uh, for those of us that work with young people or in those environmental groups, we knew things were going to change very quickly. So for us, the immediate organizing question became, how do we maintain our ethic as a residential outdoor education program in a time when two things, one, we have no students. So this is a, you're a residential program. And for those of you, even if you have day-based work, that was the same reality for you. You have no students. And in addition, when we start looking at the world that we're living in, not only is it that there's no students, but when you're trying to solve this problem, you also have to do it in a way that yourself as an organization is socially distant. So look at all of us right now. A year ago, you were all on site visiting a particular location, uh, a program that was doing amazing things in an amazing part of Ohio. And this now is in one year's time our reality in terms of how we're having those same kinds of conversations. Um, and that became, that was initially, uh, you know, Trevor and I both likened it. We are just listening to all of the news start to unfold. It, w it reminded us very similarly to the moments kind of as September 11th was trying to unfold, where you knew you were a part of something at that moment that the, the world was going to be different for a while, for a long while. Um, and, but it was also in such a scary way because you didn't know how. Um, and so at that time, uh, because I was on sabbatical and I was able to have an office down at Nahop, uh, Trevor and I were able to um, commute back and forth. And um, it was this whole, this, it truly started as a wild idea. Um, and I think that the, the phrase that we had was, why not? online outdoor education because that was something that truly from the very beginning when we had this saw this happening our initial impulse was this is who we are there's no way we would do that there's no way and at that moment as we were driving it um, immediately occurred to us well why not let's unpack why we're having that reaction and try to determine whether or not it actually is possible feasible viable and allows us to maintain who we are as an organization, staying the same, yet trying to be totally different at the exact same time. Trevor? Oh, Trevor's muted as well. Sorry. Well, uh, so the question is why? why? Why would we make that jump? Well, in my situation, running an environmental education center, outdoor education center, part of getting kids to the property is not only that opportunity to serve, but it's the opportunity to make revenue. Just like anything else, even though we're a nonprofit, you still have to make revenue. So we lost all of our spring engagement, our visibility and our revenue. School shut down. I had over 2000 kids coming to me in the spring. Boom, what do we do? Well. You have to pivot. You have to make the choice to do something different. One of the things on the early side of this is how do we keep our people employed and engaged? How can we create something uh, Matthew talked about a little bit earlier in our session is that concept of hope. 
how do we create hope in this, this time of something that we've never experienced, any of us, uh, humanity, uh, during this pandemic? We need people to feel like they're doing meaningful work. The kids that, I call them kids, they're, they're college age folks, the folks that decided to work for us seasonally are ones that, that I said again, they're the ones that are like, yes, I have an insatiable want to serve kids in the outdoors. I want to engage people, teach them a, a, an environmental ethic. I want to teach them about themselves and, and nature and so on and so forth. That work is meaningful. When we decided to make that pivot, what we realized is that that work can still be meaningful although we might be doing it differently. And so we try to connect that passion to the type of work that we had to pivot to in this digital space. And the cool thing for all of us that do this kind of work, and I've, I've looked at the list of the folks that are, that are in this webinar today, we hire people for a specific skill set. And so when we think about how do we, we change the way that we do things while at the same time providing the same kind of outcome, we need to leverage those skills. So what we focused on is how can, we, how can we take those people and leverage that? And during that time on the early side of the pandemic, uh, teachers and parents needed content. We were in a stage of emergency teaching. We didn't know what we were doing. None of us in the, the realm of how we typically uh, interface with people, but we had to create a space. So what we chose to do is we chose to push it out to our, our client base, but we thought, well, why not send it to more? So we sent it to the state of Ohio and then it organically went from there. Instead of coming to a, a place where we were trying to monetize it, we wanted to become a solution oriented facility to provide a space for people to, to have something they could engage with to, to, to do what they want to do, which is to serve kids in an environmental or uh, experiential type of uh, situation. And for us, we wanted to stay relevant in the marketplace because what you want to do is you want to create that value added space, that place where gosh, you know what? This stinks for all of us. Let's do this together and let's provide a resource so kids can be served. And that is the why. And, and Ebony in the, the chat asks a good question in terms of this idea about the digital divide, because that is so true. And this is, you know, right now, that is the, the biggest struggle that um, all areas of education are, are experiencing. I know for ourselves at the College of Worcester, just one of the biggest going back through our student um, data from uh, when the pandemic hit, um, the, the students that were having the biggest issues were the students that had the worst connections. Um, and, and those, that is, yes, becomes a prevailing trend. And so one of the things, uh, we'll talk a bit more uh, in terms of how we kind of design things to Ebony, um, one of the things that in its in its design, we were trying to utilize a very simple and easy um, technology framework. There's a lot of different tools that are out there that could have done this same kind of work that um, we put together um, in a way that's probably a bit more glitzy, um, has probably a lot more um, kind of service built in. Um, but all of those things we saw as being stumbling blocks for kids that were not provided with the best opportunity for access. So what we wanted was something that was going to be as simple as possible so that they uh, could utilize things um, quickly um, with relatively poor connections uh, to the internet. But we also wanted things to be packaged in a very simple way so that they were able to get to a hotspot or a location um, like at a library um, or any location where they could have accessed a, a signal, it's something that they could have grabbed and, and done quickly. So we'll talk a bit more in terms of that structure uh, a little bit later on, Ebony, but that's, yeah, that's a great question. It was a huge, huge consideration for us. Trevor, that's 10 minutes. I'm seeing green starting to pop back into our screen here. This is fantastic. I'm seeing some awesome images. Uh, Amy and Suzanne both post some fantastic images. Look at Suzanne, look at that array. That is fantastic. Very nice job. If you haven't done so, take a look at some of these, uh, the images coming in. These are great. These are fantastic. We have Gia uh, working in the screen right there, showing us some of her work. Very, very great. I love the creativity there. Oh my heavens, and someone even had deer. This is spectacular. <laughs> Who is it? Was this Jackie? 
Oh my gosh. Well done. Oh, now that's a handful right there. Look at all, excellent job. That was Alexander, very well done. Wonderful. Uh, any of our green people, we would like to ask you uh, a couple of questions about your green scavenger experience. Uh, so if you would be willing to chat with us, if you wouldn't mind giving us a thumbs up, that would be awesome. Just want just have a couple questions to ask you about your strategies. Ah, thank you, Natalie. Natalie, would you be willing to, to unmute yourself so we could chat with you about your experience? How are you, Natalie? I'm doing well, and I'm a College of Worcester graduate, so go woo! <laughs> yes, what, what year? Uh, 2008. Awesome. An intrepid Scott. I love it. <laughs> um, Scott. So um, my little experience going outside, so I'm in my office, and I'm in an urban area. Um, so I had to go down several flights of stairs um, <laughs> to go outside, and tried to sneak around and pick tiny bits of leaves off of landscaping that was recently planted <laughs> around our new building. Um, <laughs> so, That's good. Um, so that is what I had to do. Um, I tried to get leaves of lots of different colors and I'm realizing that leaves um, in landscaping, they tend to pick things that fit into like two categories, like excessively yeah. blue or excessively yellow. Yes. So um, I don't actually have a wide variety of leaf color, which is pretty interesting. That is really interesting, but you're so right. I mean, the whole idea of, uh, at least currently, a lot of the landscaping work is where you're just turning the saturation up as high as you can, like on your pictures, where you're, you say no yeah. filter, but we all know there's a filter. Um, yeah, that's, that is fascinating. I love it. Uh, did, you, uh, pull, did you arouse any suspicion in your plucking? Uh, I don't think so. It's pretty quiet okay, out there right now. <laughs> I don't know if people Fan. like working in the offices on the lower level of the building were like, what's that weird lady doing in that flower bed? But I kind of have that reputation around here anyway. So. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. We didn't change anything. I love it. So any of the colors that you're most proud of that you were able to find on that uh, gradient that you thought, oh man, I didn't think I'd be able to find this here. This is great. I got this really, really, really almost blue, like a, like a light blue green. So I think it's like the second one in, or let me see. So this one kind of. Well done. Very, very tiny little piece of blue fescue. Love it. Fantastic. Natalie, thank you so, so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and hopefully the rest of our green team, just looking at the, the images that are coming through from our greens, you all had very similar uh, success rates, which was good. Hopefully we did not just like Natalie didn't make you suspicious in any way with your, your neighbors or your coworkers. Um, but I, we're so proud of you. Well done green team. Um, so with that, Trevor, do you want to get our, uh, shapes people up and running? So since you've already been onboarded in this process, we sent the green folks out. What we're going to do is we are going to send the, uh, the shape people, out and about as well. So let's just unpack those uh, instructions one more time. Uh, what we're going to do again, you're going to use that handout, your phone, your iPad or other portable device, pull up the shades, uh, the shapes in nature audit grid, which is like Matthew said, really, really groovy. Uh, since you are all gifted environmental educators, we're not going to play bingo. We're going to go and try uh, and search for all of the shapes. That's right. We're not playing bingo. You're trying to get every single one of those things on that grid in 10 minutes. We think you can achieve the outcome. When we release you, once again, 10 minutes to find as many matches of the grid as possible, you are encouraged to take notes or photos of each of the shapes that you found. When you are gone, we're gonna talk to the greens, what we just talked to you about, the shapes while they were out playing. But don't worry, you won't miss anything. You already heard it. So. What we want to do is we want to send those shape people all out and about. It is 1123. You will have till 1133 to get that task done. And we'll go through the same process. Anything I missed, Matthew? No, snap, snap photos. The, the photos were awesome from our green team. So shapes people, I, they set a, a really high bar, but I know you can do it. You have this. And I will put in the chat 1133 is your return time. 
So with that said, goodbye shapes. The rest of you, please remain. We're going to have a little chat about uh, the stuff we just chatted with the, uh, the other folks about. So bye-bye shapes. Good luck. You can do it. So for those of you that remain in here, what we want to do is we want to chat a little bit about the who, what, and why. Why is this type of information relevant? And, and how did this project come to be? And, and later on, we're going to talk a little bit more about what does the future hold. When we think about the who was involved in this, this project that we created, this, this digital uh, environment, we had a wonderful opportunity. So we, we have this great synergy between two organizations, NAHOP, the institution of which I am the exec executive director of, as well as a collaboration with the College of Worcester. As you can see, having Matthew, uh, his breadth of, of knowledge and, and education pedagogy and, and how we, we think about work with kids is, is really great. Matthew happened to be on sabbatical during this time of COVID. And so he was kind of embedded and had an office down at Nahop. So he, kind of, he, he helped our team, the WHO, think about, well, what can we do differently as we have this opportunity to, to pivot and create something new, yet the same. On top of that, I have a, a pretty amazing team of folks that are, are full-time uh, professionals. I have six full-time members still uh, with me on the team here at Nahop. On top of that full-time team, we also have what we call our, our uh, seasonal field instructors. These are uh, what I call our global vagabonds, those, those wonderful young folks that are fresh into their careers that want to solve all the problems of the world, and they come to it with this amazing passion and desire to really, really serve. So you have this great uh, combination of, of humanity that are, are ready uh, for the challenge that is ahead of them. Now, I was also lucky that last year I made a, a great employment decision, and I didn't realize how great it was until we hit a pandemic. I had a young man uh, named Josh that is actually a video producer by trade. That is his degree. Now, on top of that, he actually worked camps throughout his whole growing up. So you put the, those two pieces together, we have a great formula. So that is the who of how this project came to be. Matthew's going to talk a little bit about the what. So the what we... At very quickly as an organization had to determine kind of what our organizing premise was and how we were going to do this. Um, and it, there was just no question to us. It was this idea of how do we maintain our ethic as a residential outdoor education program in a time where two things are occurring. One, we have absolutely no students. And as a residential program, that immediately in your mind would spell recipe for disaster. And for all of you, even if you don't have a residential program, but you're day-based um, or the work that you're doing is where you're going out to work with uh, people, that your reality was the same. So you have no client at that particular moment to try and serve and, and to outreach to. The second piece of this that became increasingly difficult as well is not only did you not have the, the students but if you look at our current reality, looking at the screen you're currently staring at, the work that needs to be done has to now be done in a way where we are extremely socially distant from each other. And that has that changed the algorithm too, in terms of how we, we think about doing this work. Just think one year ago, this same program was on site. You were doing a site visit to an amazing place, doing a seeing how that particular organization functioned, function, feeling kind of the, the ethic and the community that that organization has developed. And a, one year, now here we are in this world where we are all sitting in our living rooms, our kitchens, our places of work, and we are trying to, to have a similar kind of conversation and experience. And it, it changes. It makes us uh, rethink our problems uh, in, in very pronounced ways. Um, and then for us, it was the idea that where we tried to come up with um, kind of that shift that, that Trevor is talking about was, uh, so because we both live in Worcester, we were able to commute back and forth to the organization to Nahop. And it, it, our initial reaction when all this happened was we are in a lot of trouble because there's no way we're going to do uh, online outdoor education. That became such a it, I mean, I think the first time we even thought about it, we, we just laughed like, oh, that, that is just silly. Like that doesn't make any sense. Um, and then it occurred to us in about 24 hours, why not? 
What, why are we having that particular reaction? What is it about our program that we can try and encapsulate in an online world so that we can, can utilize kind of the same, same ethic and belief that we have, this whole idea of staying the same, this is who we are, but doing that in a way that is absolutely and totally different. So that was an exciting what for us to kind of coalesce around. Trevor's going to talk a little bit about kind of institutionally why this became such an important problem. So as an institution, we are a 501c3, a nonprofit that, you know, is there to serve. Uh, our mission statement says to provide a safe, nurturing, dynamic learning environment where people are empowered to succeed. So when we were thinking about that, we have a couple problems. Number one, just like any institution, you still need to make revenue. So we lost all of our spring revenue just like that, as fast as Governor DeWine could say, we're done. And so what do you have to do? You have two choices, bury your head in the sand or you can pivot and, and figure out a new way of doing things. So we chose the, the, the option of pivoting. What we needed to do is we needed to keep our people employed and engaged and had two choices there, how we did that. We could give them tasks around the property, you know, spruce it up, whatever, or what, how can we engage them based off of what they know? We want to keep people connected to uh, the feeling of doing meaningful work. That's what we're all here for. We are all here because we make a choice on a daily basis to serve our communities in the way that we do with the institutions we're a part of. So we wanted to connect that to the people that we, we wanted to keep employed and engaged. When we think about the engagement, the type of people that we get to employ, whether they're the full-time people and or the, the, the seasonal field instructors, they were hired for a specific skill set. And because they had that specific skill set, even though we might be doing it differently through screens, we could still leverage that if we could tie that to passion. And so they have a passion for educating youth in uh, an outdoor environment. And so we wanted to connect those, those things together. On top of that, when we were on the early part of this pandemic, uh, teachers and school districts and parents and nature centers, they needed content. So we had a choice. What do we do with that content? We can scale it up, we can put it out there. Do we just give it to our existing clients? Do we pitch it out to the, the, uh, the state of Ohio? We did both. We, we shipped it out and, and off it went. The content was on its way and we gave it out for free. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to um, stay relevant in the marketplace because you know the, we want people to know that we exist and that we can help uh, serve them. And so all of those things were part of the, the why. You're, you're muted, Matthew. One of the things, uh, since you weren't here, uh, one of the questions from uh, the group that was, uh, the Shapes group that was here listening from the, the first round, um, uh, Ebony had asked a question about the, the issue of the digital divide um, and, and how you kind of, how you can think about kind of jumping that gap and, and helping uh, in that way. And that's, that's a huge question. And I know that's something for us um, even looking at the College of Worcester and how we're trying to make plans uh, moving forward, um, the, the, the students, based on our student surveys, that, that had the, the hardest time in that transition period um, were the ones that, that had connection issues. Uh, and the college, it's been very difficult for them because they're looking at trying to build, you know, they're purchasing a lot of new technologies for people to use in this new kind of teaching um, but in, in that particular scenario, it doesn't matter how many things that you purchase if the student isn't able to access it or have a, a high enough speed um, to make that kind of learning meaningful, you're still going to have the same problem. And so when we looked at this, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the design process, um, we, we wanted to make sure that um, we were doing something in a way that was very accessible technology, the simplest we could possibly find. There's tons of different programs out there that do this same kind of teaching and learning work, but we wanted to make sure that we were finding something that was so simple uh, and, and would utilize the least amount of resources for a student that, you know, if they had an opportunity to grab a hotspot, if they were at the library or um, in a, a lot of the school districts that we had used, we're using the mobile buses so that students could um, pull up and grab content and use those in different locations around um, their city. Um, so that was something that was really Im important to us. Um, the, the whole idea in terms of uh, utilizing internet access, one of the things that, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, Nahap converted 
uh, a number of these um, to at home um, mail out programs. So uh, the content is actually uh, able to be repackaged and sent out to students um, so that they can have it and do it from, from their home. Uh, it comes in maybe a bit of a, a, you know, coming through the mail, there's a bit of a lag for those kinds of things, but uh, it at least provides an additional opportunity for, for the students to access that when technologically they might not have been able to do it. Okay. Well, it looks like they're coming back, Matthew. I think I, we should I'm starting to see up. some cool, yeah, yeah. I'm starting to see some really good. So take a look at some of these uh, images coming through. Some really cool shapes images. We even have a movie. So I, there was a question in a chat looking at this in terms of, is there a student grade assigned at the end of the digital experience, pass, fail, letter grade, um, written or oral exam. Um, so in terms of the content, the way it was designed and delivered uh, out to the districts, the, the, any of the teachers could choose to use that content however they wished. Uh, many of them would plug that, the content that you had access to there, uh, the Nahop link, um, into their own Google Classroom uh, formulas. Uh, so there were, you know, the quizzes that were built into the end of each lesson that the teachers actually would um, utilize some of that quiz data in their own quizzes that they would make for their students, which was awesome. Um, and the, so for, this was not anything that was related to my students uh, at the college. This was something that uh, it was all kind of, it was teacher-based in terms of the decisions that, that they were making. Um, and then we had another, Abby asked a question, how did the mail-in programs get advertised without the internet and with libraries being closed? So one of the things that we relied on, so school districts spent a lot of time in the beginning of all of this, trying to understand where the need gaps were within their uh, own districts. And so we, those things were relied upon to, for the districts to know. So you can you know, communicate with us uh, and then that content could be distributed out to um, either the district to push out themselves or um, for NAHOP. I mean, NAHOP, especially with their outdoor, their summer program and they're doing their, NAHOP is sending that content just out to, to the students themselves. And so it was, um, we really had to, for us, had to rely on the districts knowing at that particular moment, the students that had particular need. Um, but also it was, you know, Trevor would get individual communications from people um, being able to connect in um, so one of the other questions too, looking at this issue of online fatigue, um, and that's the, the program itself is intentionally designed. Um, the way we were trying to do things is very similar to what we're having you do here, where your time is spent split between um, the, the digital and the lived. And so we found that that was a significant um, hallmark in terms of a lot of this type of programming where students were not spending all their time in front of the screen, but actually um, out doing things. So, um, all right. So shapes, people coming back in from shapes. We'd love to hear if you are a shape person, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if any one of you is willing to participate and give us kind of a rundown of your experience, give us a thumbs up. Uh, we would love to hear the pictures coming through. Fantastic. People are doing an amazing job. Um, very, very well done. I, the, the curly vine is one of my favorites that I've seen so far. Um, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, William, would you be willing to uh, unmute yourself and give us, uh, give us an idea of how it went for you outside? William. Okay, I'm... so. Yes, thank you. So first of all, Matthew, uh, I've worked with your father for several years and, yes. uh, and uh, son of bomb. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Son of bomb. Couldn't have been uh, more aptly named. Uh, so, okay. So the experience with going out, uh, I'm here by myself. Uh, it was a nice break from the whole program, getting outside and away from the screen. And, uh, and it was real easy to key in on circular things. Um, a little a little hard to get back and get the picture downloaded because uh, I took yeah. the camera and all that, but it was a great experience. And uh, the challenges, uh, EE educators uh, face today are just overwhelming. And uh, I, the only thing I want to add is 
you know, we have this wonderful opportunity that people are outside more and more. I ran this morning, mm -hmm. the bike paths and the parks are jammed people. How do we leverage that yeah. and EE and bring the value added all into the equation? I mean, we've, we've got some real major positives here. Okay, I'm gonna shut up. Hey, William, can we ask which uh, shape were you most proud of finding? Was there any one that stood out? Well, I, I sent, I posted a sunflower, but um, actually, oh, well actually the seeds on poke right now, they're not ripe, but their small green circular seeds are great. I took a picture, but uh, I didn't know Wonderful. how many people would recognize it. Okay. That is awesome. Thank you so much, William. Wonderful. Well, now that we have you all back, um, we just want to go through a bit more of kind of the particulars of putting this program together and how that all worked. Um, so first things first is just a really quick timeline. And this timeline is presented um, because, we, again, we want to give you hope. Uh, this is something when we look at how to put something like this together, this went together very, very fast. Um, so that announcement came on Thursday. And by Friday of the next day, uh, the governor said, we're going to, on Thursday, schools are done. Friday, we actually at noon that day, because Trevor actually had a, a program on site um, when all that was shut down and they elected, they needed to go home early because their school actually closed. Yeah. So we had early access to Trevor's staff. And so by that, that lunch, that next, that Friday, we had rolled out to the team, the idea of this online outdoor education. And what we were trying to do we were trying to connect with the content that they already had. Nahop was geared up and ready to teach outdoor ed for the next five months to 2000 students. So why would we deviate from what we know works and what we know the students like? We just had to change the format, stay the same, yet we needed to be totally different in how we provided that experience to the students. So the teams, um, they, they were given their initial ideas in terms of what the groups that they were actually planning in. Um, Trevor's staff at that point, I think we were working with about uh, six uh, staff that were actually going to be on site, uh, the residential site uh, for the next couple of months because of their, their contracts. So those six um, started putting their, their best ideas together in terms of how do you take the existing curriculum that's there and start plugging it into um, into this new format. And one of the things that I will, uh, I apologize, I don't have in front of me now, but I'll download uh, while Trevor's talking and try and get that uploaded for you in the chat. So the way we did this um, was we created two different templates. Um, again, my background's in teacher education, so I wanted to help them think about the way in which we share knowledge and, and have students come to an experience. And so we were very specific. And when you look at the outdoor education site that's there, you'll notice there is a template. There's a format that we very specifically wanted that team to use to go through so that there was a consistency. So that when um, the more and more people that started to use this, they started to see that pattern and knew what they were getting. It became a known quantity, which was important to us. Um, by the, over that weekend, the students had, uh, Trevor's staff had that, their planning time and we actually started video production that Monday. Um, so this is now just three days out from when we started it. The video production went uh, into process um, and Josh was finished shooting the little clips from all of the, the, the teachers uh, by Wednesday afternoon. And Wednesday afternoon, Josh went into hiding and started to do all of his uh, editing magic to get all of those little clips down. Now, the, the beautiful thing, when you look at the clips and things that Josh was providing, it's all very short and very small. That's intentional, especially if you have students that have low bandwidth and they have a hard time getting access. You need those clips to be very, very tiny, very quick bursts um, so that they're not trying to stream something that's really long. So we were very intentional in how we utilize those clips and leverage that that screen time, if you will, when we were in, in front of the students. Um, as Josh was doing the editing, I then pulled Trevor's staff back in and we gave them a crash course on how to use Google Sites. Um, I had talked about before how we were very intentional in trying to use the most basic of technology and Google Sites is probably the simplest, most basic web design program that's out there. Uh, and that was intentional. We knew that a lot of schools were using Google Classroom, so that was gonna be a very easy thing for them to link to uh, and to have a part of their curriculums. And so the, the, 
the students transition from kind of the writing production phase to now turning those particular lessons into web uh, websites so that it had the flow that we were asking and requiring each of those lessons to, to work with. And so that content, um, we were doing that simultaneously as Josh was editing. Um, Friday morning was uh, me going through doing quality check and then pasting all of the uh, links for all of the videos into their assigned spots in each of the lessons. Um, and by that Friday at 4.30, we made live 14 outdoor education lessons from the Nahat curriculum for uh, public consumption. And um, that, that timeline uh, actually didn't seem crazy in the moment. When you read it now and you think, man, that's just, I'm not sure how that would be possible. It was, um, and it's something that, and the reason why it was, was we were looking at what we already did. What do we do well? And how do we do that thing that we do well just in a new environment? Um, and so because we were willing to stay the same, it made this kind of new presentation so much easier. We weren't trying to redefine who Nahop was. We knew who they were. We just needed to get that Nahop experience to people in a new and different way. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Trevor, who's going to talk a little bit about kind of the site and how that all worked. So real quickly, and then uh, we'll do some of the Q&A at the end. I see some stuff popping in and we can address it at the end of this session here. But uh, the, the where, uh, it happened at Nahop initially because we were still be able to be in a close proximity. Uh, the first week was in close proximity as production happened. As the ongoing development happened, we started to move from afar. So we had our video production team there. Then what we did is we pivoted and said, okay, now what we need you to do is we need you to use your iPhones. Here's how we situate yourselves. This is a kind of backdrop that we're looking for, this, that, and the other. So we changed some of the formula. And then those were uploaded into uh, Google Docs on which Josh could uh, edit. Because he said we started with 14 and I, I can't even remember how many lessons we have now. Uh, Matthew would probably tell you like 30, close 40. To, close to 30, yeah. With 10 more, yeah, 10 more that are in production, yeah. So we'll end up at, it's ended up 40. We taught people how to, uh, how we changed and shot the videos and exchanged the videos. And then we started to do what we do now, which we've been doing today and modeling that because we, that's what we do. We meet virtually to, to plan lessons and we looked ahead. So Matthew's going to talk a little bit about the, the, the how. So I'm going to put uh, really quickly here in the chat, two different documents that I promised for you. So one is going to be the online template, but then the other one is the Nahop lesson guidelines. Uh, and I guess, uh, well, I just sent that to Robert privately. Sorry, Robert, <laughs> you got, you got a it's sneak special. peek there, Robert. You got a sneak peek. Uh, so let me send online. This will now go hopefully to everyone. Um, okay, so if you want to take a look at one of those in a particular order, I would encourage you to first take a look at uh, the guidelines tool as opposed to the, uh, the lesson template. Uh, and the reason why is um, one of the things that we needed to do is we needed to make the document that we handed out to the staff uh, a teaching tool itself. Um, so we had spent some time with them already in the semester thinking about how they organize their lessons and what things should look like when they're actually out in the field just because you're you're out in the woods doesn't mean you you throw away the whole idea of uh, high quality uh, pedagogy and and structuring learning. Um, so we were able to kind of come back, throw back to that um, those ideas, uh, and give them kind of this this uh, overview of what we were expecting in terms of how those those uh, lessons could play out. Um, and so with them, the second page when you kind of get to that, we also wanted to give them using those the kind of the wireframe of what their web page would look like. Uh, actually utilizing some of those icons and things, um, got them to a place where they could design. The second document then is just that lesson template. They all had, were shared on this on Google Docs. Uh, this is where they built out um, their lesson plans, if you will, for what it was they were trying to teach. And then um, the beauty of that is they were able then to really quickly copy and paste from that document uh, into the actual web page, And they were able to, to kind of head on and, and make really quick gains uh, in terms of getting that content up. Um, so for all of this, when we look at what, how all of this came together, um, for number one, there was a, we were able to coalesce around this idea of a truly compelling reason. Uh, and I think that in any of our decision-making processes, that's, 
to have that really gives us clarity, uh, which is really important. Um, and one of the things that, and Trevor has got to be credited with this, is helping to make sure that your organiz organization has a deep commitment to who you are uh, and what you believe. And that's something that he has, has really tasked himself with doing to make sure uh, and to help people understand what Nahop does and how we can do that in the best possible way. And building that within the culture uh, is, is so important uh, because once you have that, you then can build this willingness um, to become totally different. Uh, and that promotes this idea of ability to be adaptive and flexible. Um, in, in all of this, uh, we were also having to retrain ourselves in how we uh, took feedback. Um, and, and that feedback then had to continually inform our propensity to pivot. Because that's something as teachers were saying, this looks great, could you modify this? Could you add this new lesson? Um, this outdoor ed curriculum became very much alive. The first 14 were all in the hop. Uh, the next 24, 26 have been all from teachers asking for content, things that they would love to have um, for their, their own students. Uh, and then last, um, this idea of the talent and the technology can all be coachable. And don't see that right now as an obstacle when you're looking at trying to do this kind of work. If you think, well, we've never built something like that, or we've never, neither had we. Uh, it, and the resources are out there. Uh, you're going to make a ton of mistakes and you're going to fumble through it. Um, but what's so cool is that this whole idea that Josh is, uh, um, Josh, who is our video production uh, producer, he kept saying to everyone, this concept of perfection is the enemy of good. And this is something we know what we're trying to do. There, it's going to be flawed. There are going to be mistakes. Um, but at this moment, we can do this. Uh, and we have to be okay that it's not perfect. And that's what we live by. Um, so if this is what Nahab did, what are Trevor and I trying to show you today? Well, what we're trying to talk about is these different levels of teaching and engagement. So obviously the most desired by all of us is this whole concept of being live. That's what we wanna be. We wanna be in front of kids. We wanna be outside doing all of these amazing things. Without a doubt, when we can get back to that, run with it, embrace it with, with open arms and, and be the best you have ever been in that particular mode. That's, we're so excited for that. But in the meantime, Trevor and I wanted you all to experience what we consider this concept of digital live. And in, in a moment such as this, where the, the people's dexterity with things like Zoom and other video conferencing platforms start to improve, um, this idea of being digital live, where you can facilitate and send people off to go do um, experiences and have them come back and talk and share those experiences, um, this digital live platform can be really exciting. Uh, and so that's something we want you to consider in terms of how do you keep that in your, your arsenal. But then the last but not least uh, is this idea of self-service. And that's what we produced with the at-home curriculum. Um, that was not something that needed any one of us to particularly mediate that learning process. It was designed based on a learning structure so that when students come and engage it, uh, it, it leads them down uh, that progression of thinking and learning and understanding. Um, but it can be done at any time and in any place. Um, and you're right, there are still some gaps in terms of how you can achieve that, especially in a digital divide. Um, but the, the potential exists uh, and being able to take something like that and convert it even into a mail-in, uh, mail-out uh, experience is possible. So when we talk about hope, we want you to step away knowing that engagement is possible and it is desired. And that's something that was very exciting for, for all of us. Um, we also want you all to know as environmental educators that what Trevor and I have done, it, we are not at all advocating this as a substitute for your traditional work. Um, what we're trying to do is create an opportunity to keep our beliefs and our strategies in front of people. Because I think William is talking about this right now, this, this idea that we if we can get people's attention, how can we keep that attention? Um, and if we disappear and vanish from their existence, that's going to be very problematic when we try to restart. And so trying to keep keeping this moving forward. Um, but as you try, uh, we encourage in wild times, uh, embrace wild ideas. 
and, and see what happens. Just see what happens. And in that, trying these wild things, keep uh, Josh in the back of your head where he keeps telling you that perfection is the enemy of good. Um, try, lead with the best intentions uh, and see, see what can come of it. Because it's from, from all of us at Nahop, we didn't expect any of this uh, to have the kind of success it did. Um, but it's spectacular what we have learned and it's spectacular to see what people have done uh, by engaging in that experience. So with that, we will step aside and ask any, uh, answer any questions you may have. Nicole, uh, anything that we have missed? Um, so just a reminder, the resources you shared, um, those will go out again uh, to everyone um, in an email, just so everybody has those uh, that attended this program today. So don't fret um, if you weren't able to download things uh, at this moment. Um, also, I uh, downloaded all of the pictures from the activity. So <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> those are really fun. So hopefully we can include that um, in our, our wrap up uh, of the, the recording of this uh, program because I would really love uh, for others to see uh, that part of uh, the, the meeting. So um, I think Joe, if you don't have anything else to add. I did see someone asking for the link for the site again. So uh, I did, uh, uh, Katrina, I put that in the uh, chat bar again for you. Uh, that would be, if that's helpful. Um, I also saw a question in terms of wondering how the students sent back to the teacher their answers to the quiz at the end. Um, so one of the things that, um, so those quiz kind of serve two, two different roles. So we wanted to have it just kind of as a general um, assessment for us at Nahop at the end, uh, but we did have specific teacher requests. And the way those quizzes were designed is the teacher could go and just make a copy uh, of the quiz if they wanted it for themselves that be able to enter into a grade book or as a participation grade, the teachers would copy that quiz and in their Google Classroom or whatever they use, they would say, when you're done, go ahead and use this quiz at the end. And so they, they took and onboarded the quiz themselves into their own curriculum. They didn't necessarily have them complete the quiz on the Nahop website. Um, so it just gave them, and, and all of that stuff, we were giving them the ownership to take it and, uh, and apply it and plug it into their curriculum however they needed. Yeah. And within Google Classrooms, you have to copy that document and so it's edible yeah. um, for people <laughs> or for the students. Yeah. And I think what we're going to end up doing here shortly is we're going to kick it back over to uh, Jeff and then uh, let him wrap up. And then Matthew and I will stick around for, for some Q&As if you, if you want to dive a little bit deeper. Sounds good. Hey, thank you all. Let's kick it over to Jeff. So to wrap it all up, I just want to thank uh, Trevor and Matt. Um, this was a very informative program. Um, I actually found it rather refreshing to have some different formats to this. Um, I've gotten so sort of like stuck in this sort of like Zoom meeting where you're just sort of sitting in one place, moving around was great, using the breakout rooms was great. So I think it's wonderful to have had you model some of this. I'll just make it as a casual observation. The fact that both Matt and Trevor were standing also brought a different energy to this sort of like meeting. And so that's something I think that I'm going to have to sort of like mess around with sort of seeing if I can get myself <laughs> elevated here. Cause I think you can just bring a different energy to the table for that. So um, a lot of little subtle things here in addition to sort of like very explicit sort of things. Um, and also I had my 13 year old son join for a little bit here. And I can tell you that he is just totally bored um, more time than he normally is uh, uh, um, been accustomed to. And it's wonderful to have you all sort of working to figure out how to make engaging curriculum. Cause I know it's going to make a big difference for our students this fall to have um, active learning exercises that actually engage them more than just them sitting in front of the screen. Because good Lord, he's sitting in front of the screen enough the way it is with some of his other recreational activities. So um, what a wonderful program. So I just want to thank you again. As is our EPN tradition, we want to recognize you for, uh, with a certificate of appreciation. Um, we offer this to, as, uh, at all of our events. Um, I'll flash it up here for a moment. Um, this has been, uh, it's in an electronic form. Normally we give this in a, in a frame, picture frame. So we're unfortunate we're not able to be in the same room, but we appreciate your, uh, <laughs> your um, efforts today, Trevor and Matt. And uh, um, we look forward to sort of like seeing the conversation continue um, here shortly. Additionally, I want to um, note to you what our schedule is coming up uh, in the future. Um, 
We have quite a bit pro, pro, pro planned through autumn 2020. Um, these are certainly unprecedented times. Several weeks ago, our school and the EPN developed a survey that many of you received and perhaps participated in already. The purpose of the survey is to guide our programming um, into the future. Um, we really appreciate the information we got back to you and uh, um, um, we're anticipating that we're probably gonna be doing a lot more remote um, EPNs in the fall, um, despite the fact that we can have some modest sort of face-to-face, -face. the prudent thing is probably to do continue this. But if you do have some feedback on whether you'd be interested in doing some face-to-face, -face, please consider taking the survey through Friday. It closes then. Uh, if you've not had a chance to share your feedback and still would like to help us chart, chart our path forward, we'd love to hear from you uh, or send a message to uh, uh, Joe or Nicole and let them know that you would like to participate in the survey. Looking ahead at our next EPM webinar program scheduled for 10 a.m. on August 11th, we'll feature Kyle O'Keefe, Director of Innovation and Programs with the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio. This program will explore insights and industry knowledge about the conditions, trends, opportunities, and activities taking place that are impacting our region's waste stream including shifts that occurred during the recent COVID-19 slowdown in residential and commercial, commercial trash, recycling, and food waste. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to this one because uh, um, it's amazing to think of all these cascade effects of when you sort of shut down one sector of the economy, how it affects waste in another. And so I think we're gonna get a good sort of sense of like what's happening there and how the sort of commercial markets have changed in response to this. So uh, it should be a very informative program. Uh, and even if you're not, uh, uh, um, totally into this sort of like space. Um, we always sort of like come away with tidbits that are useful in, in other contexts. Please stay tuned for registration details, which will be available soon at the epn.osu.edu. Thanks again for all who joined us today and please stay safe and well-connected. I wanna give a good a big shout out to Nicole Jackson who uh, uh, championed this particular uh, um, um, program. Um, Nicole's brought a lot of value to the EPN in terms of coming up with great ideas and really helping challenge us to sort of like move in new directions. So great job, Nicole, in putting this together. And thank you, Joe Campbell, for sort of like um, coordinating this all too. Um, now, um, I appreciate the time to visit with you. I'm going to duck out, but we're going to turn it over to Matt and Trevor, who will remain on the Zoom meeting here until 1230 to answer any continuing questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank all you right. so much, Jeff. So with that said, I see there's a lot of questions in there and I'm not sure how we want to tackle those. And, and now that we have only 40 some people on the screen, um, you know, that uh, gives us more, a little bit more flexibility. So how do, how do we want to tackle these? Yeah, so I'm okay with the, the hand raising situation again. Um, I know we have some things in the chat that we didn't necessarily go over. So whichever one you want to sure. start hey. with, we can do chat, switch over to, to video, audio. I took down a bunch of the chat ones, Trevor. Do you want me to jump on those? So let's jump on them. Let's do it. And, yeah. And so uh, the first I saw there was a tech question that had the in terms of the video software that was used. Um, that was one of the things too that um, uh, because of Josh's background, he had the potential to utilize something that was extremely sophisticated. But we actually asked him not to um, because that again, this was something that we wanted to make sure that whatever the process was, because we did not know what was going to happen. This was in the first week of this crazy pandemic thing. So um, we wanted him to be using something that we all could be able to utilize and access on our machine. So he just used the iMovie um, to be able to do all of that on his machine. So he has a Mac, um, but we also made sure that the, I think it's the Win Windows Media Movie Maker or whatever, the, <laughs> there's a free version there as well, um, that we weren't using crazy sophisticated technologies because that wasn't going to work at some point what if josh couldn't be editing those things and so we needed to be able to step into that same role so everything we were trying to select was kind of baseline most most basic um so that was that was really important for us to make sure that that was happening um i also saw there was a question about in terms of engaging high school students uh, and if we learned things about how to engage students at different levels um, so that's a really good question. So Nahop's curriculum is very much focused on on middle school. And so that four, four, nine range. And I will say that there, there was not a lot of participation in that ninth grade range. Um, but the, from that four, eight, uh, there was a, a ton of participation. Um, but in terms of how we, in, you know, looking at that from how we might think about engaging um, different age levels of students, one of the things that, um, we've talked about is the idea of how do you tier those particular lessons in a way so that um, students can have and bring the technology with them. So one of the things we might shift is for a high school student 
um, it might actually be just something that it's a handout that they would take with them that is then coded with QR codes. So at various moments when they're outside, because, you know, assuming that maybe a high school student would be able to spend a bit more time outside by themselves um, doing some of these things, they wouldn't have to come back into a screen. So the, the page then as they would go through, they could scan QR codes along with each step that would pull up then a video for them uh, or embedded instructions into the QR code that would give them some of their next steps. Um, so again, trying to create a bit more autonomous or autonomy for, for some of those older students too, and, and not thinking about, can, we liked to have the, the younger students go out and then come back, go out and then come back so that we were giving them kind of more check-in moments. Trevor, what am I missing? Uh, just one other thing, one of the things that Matthew and I had the privilege of uh, connecting with people all over the, the world uh, on this project, but we didn't meet this wonderful woman, like I want to be in her classroom. Her name is Kathy Law out of New York. And so Amazing. if you send me an email, I will connect you with Kathy because she's doing some, some really, really great stuff with her students. And she did a webinar on that for that, that secondary level people. So I'll connect you with them. So just send me an email at trevor at and uh, I'll be able to connect you with Kathy. Um, Other questions? We also, yeah, uh, Trevor, a couple different questions in terms of uh, how, whether or not you had a lot of um, people that were required or contracted to come in the spring, whether they actually engaged the curriculum. And we actually had a ton of uh, the, the take up on that was fantastic. It was absolutely spectacular. And so when we think about that, uh, it was really interesting. Um, they dove deep and a lot of our client base used that as a resource uh, this spring. And we, we saw, like Matthew was saying before, we actually sent out in our information to those, those, those folks saying, what else do you need? What else do you want? So it kind of helped us um, come up with the ideas of how to create new lessons and where the content area, where the need was. And like Matthew said, currently we actually have uh, uh, one staff member that is taking those leads from our teachers that we had from the spring, teachers that we knew, and a lot of teachers we didn't know. So I, yeah. there's a lot of people through this space. I have no idea who they are, but they've requested things. We put it in our queue and uh, our, our good friend Morgan is developing a lot of this content right now for the, those, those folks. So that way, when fall happens, we have even more resources available to, to people. Another thing so, I and, saw, go ahead, Matthew. Well, and to, to be able to kind of track that, because that's something that I'm trying, I can't, I don't remember who, maybe it was Abby uh, that asked that question. Um, so one of the things that we love about this uh, program, the Google Sites program, is it automatically dovetails right into Google Analytics. And so you actually can get a zip code analysis of where your participants are coming from. And so you, it's amazing because you get this heat map of where your participation is. So if you know regionally where your clients are coming from and if you're targeting them specifically with marketing, you can actually see how well that is being kind of taken up. So Trevor, knowing the districts that he serves, he's able to you know target and then track to see how, how many, um, how much participation now is then coming from that particular zip code um, that kind of gives us a, a ballpark understanding of how many people are, are engaging and participating. So that's been really, really helpful. And then it's, blows your mind to see that it's all over the country and then all over the world. It's just, it's really, really cool. There was a period of time. Our third biggest user was the country of Hungary. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I have Hungarian roots. So it kind of made me happy. Um, on top of that, I think there was a question about, uh, accessibility, uh, digitally. Yeah. So does Nahat feel like reaching out to students digitally as accessible is as accessible to students as in the in-person experience? Do I think it's as accessible? No. no. Are we making modifications to make it more accessible than we did in the past? Absolutely. So for example, right now we're doing a project we call Nahop at Home uh, for our summer program. And what we've done is we've really changed the, the model to then what you saw here. It's a completely different program to really think about who is that end user and how do we change that space whether it's the Zoom space, size of numbers in that space, what kind of activities, what type of engagement, what type of uh, supports that they need throughout that experience. So is it as accessible? No, but when we think about accessibility, how do we change that model to make sure that, that we are trying to impact those kids the best that we possibly can? So that program actually at two o'clock, we'll have the second part of that 
session because we're doing the digital live uh, as well as the, the, the take as well. So it's, it's kind of a hybrid model where there's a lot of support networks in there. And I think in anything that we do in this new space, being honest about what we think it can accomplish is really important. And I think I listened to our, I gave them this example earlier this morning when we were talking that our, our local superintendent was asked a question in a, a public forum about gifted education for the district. And they said, you know, will we be offering gifted services? And he said, yes, we will. He said, is it a program that we will turn around and point to to say that we're very, very proud of? He said, probably not because of where we are and what we're trying to do. And so I think that even, even in this situation where we're being asked to do something we've never done, being honest about that with your, your client base in terms of what you're hoping to have accomplished. Don't promise the world because it, we might not be able to deliver that. And so I think Trevor's point of that's the basis for the organization is helping students with special needs. And no, he's right. It's not, it's not as good as if, if they were with us, but they're trying and they're, they're trying to make those small adjustments to get ever closer to that desired goal. Uh, another quick question that we had was from uh, William. He said, what percentage of students who pre-registered for the original outdoor programs have are will engage in your virtual programs this summer. There are two separate things. So the one was outdoor education, the other was our, our summer camp for kids with special needs. When we look at that, the engagement that we had from our client base for the outdoor education was boom. We probably had even more engagement because what we did is we not only gave it to our sixth grade or fifth grade or seventh grade groups that were supposed to come for the experience, but they got pitched out to their, their whole district. So you would find that that you could see when classes were being assigned in different districts and you were like, oh my gosh, look at Brunswick today. Wow, off the, off the hook. It is, it's amazing how many kids. Wow, look what type of engagement. Or you could see it happening in Colorado or New York or California. You could see these little bubbles, these heat maps. Um, what we're finding is one of the things we pitched out to our client base is let's find a little feasibility. So if you can't come to us in the fall, what we did is we originally pitched our, our springs to falls and now those falls that, that were rescheduled for fall are now moving to doubles in the springs. Some of these people are saying, okay, yes, we want to do this. So we're doing a little bit of the, the Nahop at home. We're also having some of the client base say, okay, it's not, we're not going to be able to engage kids in the spring. So what is the best outcome? So we're talking a little bit about digital live with them uh, using the Nahop at home as the tool with some, some stuff on the top and the bottom with the teacher support. So there's different models going on for, for all the client base that, that we're currently working with. And then I saw William ask what percentage of the students was K-4. And William, I'd say it, we're looking at probably about maybe a quarter of the students ended up being in the, from those younger grades. Um, and in, in those, uh, you know, some of the requests that were coming in was in terms of some of the, the structure and language that we were using in terms of how we built the site and those kinds of things. Um, what was hard is that um, what, you know, Nahop's primary mission for their outdoor programming is middle school. And so that was really, you know, targeting in terms of the language and structure for the, the lessons really hit, hit that middle grade band. Um, so we didn't do a tremendous amount of adapting for primary uh, grades at that point. We just, we didn't have the people to do that. Um, and at, at the, at that particular moment, we just, we were, it was such a popular uh, resource that we were getting so many requests for content. We just didn't have the time to, to kind of shift our gaze lower. Um, and that's something that Trevor's staff was not designed. They were not hired with a primary intention. Uh, and so that's a very specific skill set. And so again, we had to know what we were good at and we had to know what skills we had in front of us. And so we did not want to try and stretch people to a point where we were asking them to be something they weren't because it just, it would not it wouldn't work. Um, so that's, you know, if we had that skill set in the future, yes, we would totally kind of lean after, add that, but we just, it's not there right now. Matt. Yes. Uh, Chris, Christy had a question. I don't know if you saw this in the previous. Um, she was asking if you had any issues with um, online fatigue. Oh, yeah. So online fatigue, that's a really good question. Um, we were trying to design all of these experiences 
uh, with that idea of not being in front of your computer as much. And so that's why all of the lessons utilize this outdoor adventure experience where you have a moment to get instructions and you uh, work with some of the content that gives you the foundational knowledge for what you need. And that was to be short. But then you were given instructions and you turned your computer off and you went outside to do something. And so that was our attempt to try and battle the, the online fatigue part. Um, we also think that having it be a self-service model helped in that online fatigue uh, issue. Um, sometimes the idea of doing something synchronous uh, is much more tiring because you're feeling like you have to be on and you have to be participating in a certain time. So allowing a student to consume the content and, and do the experience when they're ready, I think actually um, it might not fight online fatigue, but we're trying to do as much as we can to create something that doesn't add to that. It allows the student to kind of access as needed as opposed to we're all meeting at one o'clock to do this thing. And that's, I, I think that's key for the upper grades, so ninth grade and, and on, um, kind of that sense of ownership with what you're learning and kind of giving that time to digest everything, but also build on it. So I see Nancy asked a question. So the, if you go through some of the lessons, so the, I would say it ended up being 50% of the lessons, uh, the teachers weren't involved in the instructions at all. They would, in their Google Classroom, they would paste a link to the, it's not easy being green activity. And the teacher would say, hey, today for uh, virtual outdoor ed, I want you to do the, it's not easy being green activity. I look forward to talking with you in our class meeting about how it went. Um, so no, the teachers weren't providing any additional instruction. Now that said, we had some really fun teachers that would actually video themselves doing the activities too, so that the students could actually see their teachers participating in all of these different activities. And then they would challenge them to, hey, send a link. They, they were using resources like Flipgrid and all those kinds of really fun things that are out there right now for kids to share with their teachers what they're doing or just simple uploads they had to um, in their Google Classroom accounts as well. Um, but they, yeah, they did not, the ones that we had talked to and the ones that we've been in contact with were not taking the lessons and recreating the video instructions. The, the videos or the, each lesson is self-contained so that a student should be able to do that without any additional prompting or, or coaching from their teachers. It, it was really fun to see my daughter's a fifth grader going to be a sixth grader next year. And with uh, her school district, they're like, she would come to me, dad, one of our lessons is on the, on my, my lesson for the day. And so she would come in and share with me what lesson was happening that was assigned this, that, and the other. So that, that was really, really quite enjoyable. Um, we do have another question there from Robert that says, do you ever teach students to research a topic assigned or self-determined by Googling and assessing what they learn by Googling properly? Not too broad of a Google topic. Uh, no, not, I, not, not for me, not, not right now. Not, yeah, we, that's not something, I mean, obviously for a different context and setting, yes, but that, that whole, we did not start adding some of those secondary objectives into this in terms of like how to be a good digital steward and all of those kinds of things, which could, yeah, would be a, some really fun kind of evolution of that um, library of, of resources, but that's, that was not, yeah, we did not have any of that kind of technology teaching to go into that. What other kind of questions think, do we have? I think we have all the ones through the chat. I think, uh, anyone, I see there's still a number of people still in the room. If you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Let us know. We'd love to help in any way possible. You can join our screen even if you want to talk face to face. I'll throw a question out there. Um, Jeff mentioned he observed that you were both standing up and that brought in additional energy. Was that intentional? Do you intentionally teach standing up or is that something random? <laughs> I cannot sit still. I, it's not possible. It's not possible. So yeah, the standing desk, standing desk is the, it has to, that's what it's gotta be for me. And yes, in my own classroom, I don't, well, and so 
it's probably hardwired into me. I do that with my students so that we can model classroom management strategies throughout the lesson that we're teaching. And so being mobile as a teacher is important so that you can utilize proximity, so that you can answer questions privately for students, so that you can um, do all of those kinds of things. And so I guess because this is, I'm in teaching mode, I, I would go crazy if I had to sit down during this particular moment because that's just, I might need to come over and stand next to you, Joe, because you're being unruly <laughs> at that particular moment. I'm not sure how I do it here, uh, but I guess that that's just hardwired right now into my system. So, yeah. And so for me, I think I uh, was one of those kids that was never labeled ADHD, but I probably am. So I've had a stand-up desk for years. And so particularly in instructing, uh, this, is, this is very key. So, and I see Susan on our screen. Hello to you. <laughs> Any Good any other you. questions we have some from some folks here? Christy oh, has a question. Yeah, I saw Christy. Do you have any tips for teaching in the fall for higher education? Uh, I actually I just had to do two professional development sessions uh, talking about this um, for Worcester, and um, my advice has been very. It's very focused on the the person. It's it's very human centered, and um, I'm encouraging my department. Um, to we're most likely all going to be utilizing some sort of hybrid experience where we will have students in front of us face to face for a certain amount of time and then they'll have their online learning. Um, and I sent Trevor a mock up for my uh, course design and I said, does this look familiar to you? <laughs> and my, my course, I'm designing it to be the online learning components to look exactly like the Nahop Outdoor Ed. So they are going to have small pieces of instruction for me they're gonna have ways to get content from a wide range of, of modalities. They're going to be asked to actually go out and apply whatever that concept is in a physical uh, action oriented way. Then we're gonna come back together and review and reflect. And so, yes, so that in terms of the outdoor red structure, I'm trying to also live what I've been asking people to do. Um, in the face-to-face -face environment, what I'm asking my department to do is use that moment to build community with content as kind of the secondary driver for being there. Um, and so in those moments, uh, especially for an institution like the College of Worcester, face-to-face -face is our bread and butter experience. And so when they're with us, I want to make sure that we are using that time to get to know each other and to to organize our thinking as a learning community around the topic so that we can still utilize um, why you know the, the whole intent and purpose on being there um, i have also encouraged our department to when we think of things from a hybrid perspective to think less is more and so i want um, you know so typically our classes are two hours long uh, in this environment i do not want us to be designing two hour long classes. Uh, I would rather split my class and meet with each half for an hour because students, uh, especially in a socially distanced classroom, um, we're gonna feel much more awkward. Uh, the typical um, strategies that we're all used to using, pull up a chair next to the person next to you, you know, gather around this uh, you know, particular topic and have a conversation. Uh, if we're asking students in, in my institution requiring students to say six feet apart, I actually walked in and I saw the tape on the floors and I wanted to scream, but it's okay. We'll figure it out. Um, we'll probably find some game to play. Like I immediately thought of like a giant room of four square, like you played <laughs> on the, you know, outside when you were a kid. I'm like, all right, I'm going to get probably fired for breaking things this year. But, um, but I think that it's that idea of, Reduce, reducing your number and your time. Because if you meet for a really long time, you're gonna be compelled to share and do too much. And you're gonna overextend the strategies that you actually have at your disposal. You're gonna make those, they're gonna go from novel to, a, to dreadful really fast because you're gonna to have to over rely on those things. Um, and those classes they're going to are all going to be the same. And so, you know, the, the less time you can meet um, in that face-to-face, -face, focusing that on the community and the connection orientation. The content is out here. And if you're the one, you know, facilitating that through a Nahop style site, great. You'll be able to, to handle that. Um, but really focusing on the, the people and the connections when they're in front of you. That's, that's my strategy. And it might be terrible. I have no idea. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm right. going with. I'll well, tell thank you. you. I'll, I'll report back in September. Thank you. Um, my picture isn't showing up for some reason. 
but I've been trying to think about ways, um, just as you were doing your presentation today and the going outside and how that can be adapted to so many other kinds of educational settings and how we need to be creative right now. And I feel like our choices that are being given to us are either online or in the classroom. And there's nothing in the middle of using right. outdoor spaces or more creative ways of doing things online than just sitting for, like you said, two hours. Um, I'm not able to sit at the computer anymore. <laughs> and I just think, I was thinking about how I wasn't enthusiastic about preparing for class. How are the students gonna be enthusiastic? Right. And I do to bring some of that joy of learning back for myself as well. And how can I use other kinds of environments in this process besides just sitting at the computer and doing what I did in spring when I didn't have much time to prepare yeah. things through. One of the things that we did, and it's, simp it's a small thing, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. We went and we found that um, oh, right. we were able to get uh, folding camp chairs for $6. And so we bought 60 of them and we made 12 teach anywhere tubs. So I got trash cans and in a trash can is 12 folding chairs, uh, clipboards, uh, small dry erase whiteboards, and then sanitizer. And so just like you were saying, Christy, like at some point you need to go somewhere else. And so these tubs are for all the members of the department. They, if we're meeting just in groups that are a half, we hopefully shouldn't have more than 12 students. So you can just grab the trash can, take the tubs and you know, our, our organizing principle is the campus is your classroom. So wherever you need to be, and mother nature might not approve on that particular day, <laughs> but for the days that it's, it's possible, you're right, get out, um, change. And, but the, you know, when you talk to teachers about things that don't go well when you're outside, the biggest issues are seating. Uh, nobody wants to sit on the ground, um, especially, you know, if it's been dewy or damp or any of those things, uh, things to write on and things to write with. And so what we're trying to do is solve all three of those problems in one trash can. So here's some adequate seating that's going to work. You're not going to get dirty. Uh, here's something to write on with a clipboard and something to write with, with the dry erase marker and then ways to clean it all up when we're done. So I don't know if that helps. That's, we'll see again how that, you know, Right now, all of this is good in theory, but we'll see how it plays out in September. Yeah, thank you. So we have about yeah. five more minutes in the Q&A and I wanted to answer a question for Cindy real quick. So basically the teachers were, uh, gave the lessons out to the students and then accountability from the students was during the Google Classroom time the next day. I would say that's a yes and. Uh, some of the teachers, if they didn't have a Google Classroom, they actually, instead of our assessment, they assigned a different assessment. Or they asked, uh, like we did today, as we modeled that, you know, uh, send us pictures of what you did or uh, if there was a worksheet or if there was some sort of visual engagement, those things had to be uploaded and, and submitted. So, you know, there was different structures across the board. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Robert. 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 Hey, I'm 80 years old. I graduated from Purdue in 1961 in conservation education. Awesome, I, awesome. I was a university professor in policy, but I applied what I learned in conservation. Why couldn't you have a, a, a course long or a, uh, like collecting insects or leaves and you you teach them how to mount them and then they can report back periodically about here's how I'm going I need help and, and it wouldn't be just going over 10 minutes it would be more of a course long thing I remember collecting insects when I was at Purdue and uh, also we sent mail out to get information this was before computers and I had a, I must have gotten a whole mess of stuff I sent to different organizations and I got information on the different topics so that's just some ideas from us i absolutely love that idea and actually yeah. i'm going to be calling morgan about that idea today i think it's fantastic <laughs> well, that well that's you know good. that's hey, could be a, live, a next evolution for that kind I of retirement center here and we i'm looking at my window at a uh i live in a ravine in clintonville it was uh -huh. from the glacier we had a thousand feet of ice above me and i've identified 53 trees in 19 species. And I'll tell you, the willows and the black maples, they interbreed. And I learned a heck of a lot by Googling. And I think particularly at the high school level, maybe at the lower level, you can assign topics. And I learned a lot by, uh, I was trying to get different si uh, sizes of buds. And I finally said, 
what willows have two millimeter buds. So, I mean, you can learn by Googling. I, I really learned a lot here. I couldn't have done it by just a typical tree manuals I have. That's awesome. Thank you, Robert. And that's one of the things that when we look at the, the out the red, the at home site, the, the evolution of that, you know, this, these are um, singular lessons that teachers can pull together around a thematic idea. Uh, and the next evolution of that could be project-based um, experiences. Yeah. So like Robert was saying, you know, maybe it's something that this is kind of the organizing problem that you're, you're working on. And these are the, the pro the projects that you will undertake to solve that particular problem. And so it could be a much more longitudinal study as yeah. opposed to something that's currently kind of more of a discrete moments. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. This was great. And, and, uh, these EPN things have been on for seven years and I go to many of them. And Joe knows I usually ask sort of pointed questions, but I wasn't asking pointed questions. I was thanking you guys and giving you some good advice. And I appreciate the fact that you're going to maybe pick up on some of it. Well, I think I might you appreciate up Robert's stuff from you as well. So um, it's a win-win. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add in terms of, um, and this is something I've talked about with Ann Baird, um, with the Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist Program, and Matthew Schumar, um, who focuses on the birding chapter, uh, and is, is connecting with communities, um, low-income communities, uh, youth of color who um, want to know more about nature and the outdoors, um, but reiterating, you're talking about place place-based and project-based um, education and learning um, is, is promoting more of the backyard um, nature and, and what you have in your backyards. Uh, I feel like a lot of youth that I've worked with in the past, specifically youth of color, um, don't have that initial connection or interest uh, to nature in the outdoors um, where they live. And I feel like speaking to that in some way is definitely gonna be helpful with this type of programming and um, helping them like really kind of dig deeper and exploring what's in their backyard and, and what that means to them um, in their community to help better uh, support their communities, make them healthier um, and increase their learning opportunities. Love it. Do you have any more questions in the, uh, I don't see any more in the chat. If not, we thank, thank you, you all, everyone. This is really wonderful. And I'm so glad we had all of these wonderful participants. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. <laughs> and I'm going to get Matthew a t-shirt that says SOB. Right <laughs> hey. Thank you so, so just, much. It was fantastic. Thank, thank you, Betsy. Thanks much. Thanks much. So everyone yeah. um, that attended uh, will be getting a follow-up survey within the next 24 hours. Um, so again, give us your feedback. Um, we'll also be sending out resources uh, from this um, virtual event. And hopefully um, for the rest of the day, you have some time to get out and, and continuing your exploration. It's a beautiful day. Hopefully you don't have any rain. Um, <laughs> But if so, that's still an opportunity to engage with nature. So um, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Joe, but this was wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I know I'll be teaching this fall. I took, I have pages of notes from our several conversations in today's meeting. Uh, Trevor and Matt, uh, Matthew, thank you so much. And Nicole, wonderful uh, topic. And thanks for facilitating and in, in all, all, all of you being part of this. It was wonderful. Thank you. I was just sitting, sitting and eating my fake popcorn because it was a magical. <laughs> All right, until next time, thank you everyone.